Every muscle fiber cell is composed of 200 to 1,000, even 2,000 of these contractile rods called myofibrils. They just pack into that cell as tightly as possible. Inside of every myofibril, you're going to find the actual causes of a contraction, the myofilament. Myofilaments are the smallest component of a muscle. These tiny protein filaments come in two types, thick and thin. This picture of the myofilaments shows the thick filaments in the middle in yellow and the small thin filaments on the sides in red. They contract by sliding past each other to shorten and then releasing to stretch back to their original size. This picture shows us them in their relaxed state. The thin filaments on the side and the thick filament in the middle. We have an anchor for our filaments. The thin filaments are anchored to the line shown inside of these red boxes. The anchor for the thick filament is shown here in this blue box. It's to these anchors that the filaments are secured. The actual names for these anchors are the Z disc for the thin filament anchor and the M line. Think of the middle for the thick filament anchor. The Z-disc, we did actually have a previous student ask, why is it called the Z-disc? And it was discovered by a German scientist who gave it a name that is very difficult to pronounce and starts with a Z. Everybody eventually just shortened it down to the Z-disc. Whenever you look at myofilaments, we divide them up into a space called a sarcomere. A sarcomere is the distance. We divide them into a distance called the sarcomere. This is the distance from one Z-disc to the next. Myofilaments contract by drawing the thin filaments with their Z-disc towards the center. Here's a picture of a stretched or relaxed sarcomere on top and then a contracted one below. When they are relaxed, the thick and thin filaments are going to look different on this microscopic view. The thin filaments show up as light colored or white, and the thick filaments show up dark. Areas where the two of them overlap become dark. So on the top, you're able to see the very noticeable light and dark areas of the relaxed sarcomere. Since they're so spread out, there's less overlap between the two. Whenever they contract and slide past each other, as the thick filaments pull the thin filaments towards them, it brings the Z-discs together and it causes a bigger overlap, making them appear very dark in comparison. Here's another example of a sarcomere. Your hand would be the Z-disc and your fingers would be the thin filaments. The black rubber is the thick filament in the middle. This is a relaxed state on the left and a contracted state on the right. It's contracted and drawn closer together. Which of these pictures shows a contracted sarcomere? Since the Z-discs are pulled closer together and we see less of the white areas, the bottom picture is going to be the contracted state. The sarcomere itself has shortened. Now, a single sarcomere shortening doesn't really have an effect. But if every single sarcomere inside of a myofibril contracts, and every myofibril rod contracts inside of a muscle fiber cell, and going bigger, if all of your muscle fiber cells are contracting, we can then cause the entire muscle to contract and shorten, providing movement. Let's give names to those protein filaments. The thick one is called myosin. This is made up of just protein that is wrapped and structured in such a way that it has large heads on it. These heads want to bind to the thin filament, but unfortunately they're blocked the majority of the time. The thin filament is also composed of protein and it's called actin.
Actin has two associated regulatory proteins that affect how it works, tropomyosin and troponin. Tropomyosin helps with stabilizing the actin, and troponin helps with the control of the binding sites. So what allows the myosin to bind to the actin? Myosin wants to bind to actin, but actin's regulatory proteins have the binding site blocked. This is when your muscles are not contracted. They are relaxed. Suddenly, you decide that you want to take a step. You want to blink your eyes. To contract your muscles, you are going to release calcium. Calcium flows to the actin and causes the binding sites to open. Myosin will immediately bind and begin to contract those muscles. Here is a picture of your myofilaments. We see the thin filament actin on top with its troponin and tropomyosin regulatory proteins. Then the thick filament myosin is on the bottom with all of its heads that want to bind to the actin. When calcium is released, it's going to come and bind to the troponin, which will then release the binding sites for the actin. The myosin heads are going to bind to the actin and form a cross bridge. They then exert a pull that pulls the actin towards the M line. Let's watch a video to see that in action. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. Length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. I hope seeing that in action will help with the understanding of what's going on inside of those muscles. This is the real-life version of what you saw in the video. It's an electron microscope view of the thick and the thin filaments with their myosin heads. The calcium that is used by your muscles comes from an organelle called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is the muscle cell version of the endoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores the calcium, and waits to be triggered to release it. Here's a picture of a myofibril, which on the left side we can see the sarcoplasmic reticulum shown in blue surrounding it with a network. On the right side, that has been stripped away so we're able to see the sarcomeres and the myofilaments. There's also a structure called the T-tubule, a contraction will take several steps. Myofilaments will contract when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It binds to the troponin on actin. Troponin changes shape, freeing up a binding site for the myosin. And the myosin forms a cross bridge with actin and pulls it towards the M line. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin forming a cross bridge. After the myosin head binds and pulls, it will need to release the actin to bind pool again. To do that, it has to have an ATP molecule bind to the myosin head 
causing it to release the actin. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a crossbridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. A muscle contraction is going to be stimulated by a nerve impulse. Nerve cells generate and send an electrical current along the muscle fiber's outer membrane, called the sarcolemma. If I decide to make a movement, say I'm going to pick up a water bottle, that impulse is going to travel down from my brain through my spinal cord until it finally goes out on a motor neuron. A motor neuron produces movement, and that neuron could run down all the way to my fingertips that are going to grasp the bottle. The impulse travels down the neuron, and when it reaches the muscle fiber cell that controls the muscles of my finger, it stimulates the outer layer of the sarcolemma. This impulse is going to travel down into the muscle cell itself and cause that release of the calcium that triggers the contraction but it all starts with that impulse traveling down the motor neuron to the individual muscle fiber cell. We have a motor unit. That's one motor neuron plus the muscle cells it stimulates. The number of fibers stimulated can be one or it could be hundreds. Because my fingers may need to make very small, precise movements, you want to not control too many muscle cells. A motor unit that goes to your leg to help with walking or running is going to be able to control a much larger number of muscle cells. The movement that it does is bigger, it's not as precise. Let's watch and see how that nerve impulse comes to the cell. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils, where they trigger a muscle contraction. Okay, that might make a little more sense now after watching a video. That impulse traveled down the neuron and came and met the actual sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Where it meets is called that neuromuscular junction. This picture lets us see what that actually looks like in person. The horizontal bands that change color, those are the different muscle cells. So here's one muscle cell going all the way across. Here's a second and a third. What looks like a tree is that motor neuron coming up and branching out as each muscle fiber cell has its own neuromuscular junction as the neuron meets it and it kind of enlarges and swells at the end. Here's a drawing of what that looks like in greater detail. Our motor neuron is coming in and it swells when it meets the muscle fiber cell. When the motor neuron brings that impulse, it travels into the cell and signals for the release of the calcium, 
that then causes those individual myofilaments to contract. The neuromuscular junction is the place where the nerve and the muscle communicate. The synaptic knob is the swelling at the end of that motor neuron. The specific part of the neuron that sends the impulse is called the axon. So that's why we're using that word on this slide. So the end of that axon is called the synaptic knob, and it's where the axon swells and stores a chemical to let it communicate with the muscle cell. It contains acetylcholine, ACH. This is a neurotransmitter. It just allows two different cell types to communicate. Where the synaptic knob meets the sarcolemma is a specialized area. It doesn't just meet anywhere on the sarcolemma. It's called the motor end plate. This specialized area is covered in receptors for acetylcholine. When the synaptic knob releases the acetylcholine, it binds to the motor end plate's receptors. On our picture here, the motor end plate is a little more wrinkled. That's just to increase the surface area. The space between the two structures, the synaptic knob and the motor end plate, or the specialized membrane of the sarcolemma, is called the synaptic cleft. It's just a gap that the acetylcholine is going to cross to reach the muscle cell. This picture really gives us a good idea of all of those acetylcholine receptors that are waiting for it to be released from the neuron. In summary, let's look at all of those steps involved in a muscle contraction. The impulse is going to travel down the motor neuron to the synaptic knob. Acetylcholine is released and crosses the synaptic cleft to that motor end plate. The activation at the motor end plate is going to cause the impulse to travel down the T tubules to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The T-tubules is just innervations of the membrane that travel down into the cell. Calcium is then released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it binds to the troponin on the actin. The troponin changes shape, freeing up a binding site for myosin. Myosin then forms a cross bridge with the actin and pulls it towards the M-line. ATP binds to myosin, causing it to release the actin, and the myosin can now would be reactivated to do another pool. Because there are so many steps, and so much has to happen in the correct order for a muscle movement to occur, there are a couple different ways that we can mess this up. The first one is by acetylcholine receptor loss. This is called methemia gravis. And if you lose your ACH receptors from your own immune system attacking them, it can lead to progressive muscular paralysis. Basically, once your body decides that for some reason those acetylcholine receptors, it will attack and destroy them. When it does that, your body is releasing the acetylcholine to communicate with the muscle, but because the receptors are gone, the muscle cell is not being activated. This man is awake, but he cannot control his left eyelid because those acetylcholine receptors have been destroyed. Another type of paralysis is from botulism. Unlike the last slide, this form of paralysis comes from the bacterial toxin botulism. It prevents the release of acetylcholine at the synaptic knob, and because the acetylcholine is not released, there is no communication with that muscle cell, and your muscles do not respond. We can get this commonly from food. If, for example, canned food is, begins to spoil in just the right way where the botulism bacteria is able to grow, it will produce this chemical. This boy is wide awake, but he has zero control of his facial muscles. The eyelids droop, he can't talk. All of that is paralyzed due to the toxin. Botox is actually a manufactured form of botulism. We take a toxin called botulinum toxin type A, produced by those bacteria, and we only use a tiny amount, and we inject that into a muscle to cause it to not contract. 
if you are frowning a lot and you're wrinkling your forehead up and it's really contracted and we inject the Botox, then that botulism toxin is paralyzing those muscles but making you look younger and your skin look better because it's no longer wrinkled up. Such a strange thing to do. Now you know where Botox comes from. On the list of how a muscle contraction happens, this is where the botulism toxin affects it. It makes it so that the acetylcholine is not being released from the synaptic knob. Another form of paralysis that's different from these two is whenever you have your nerves damaged. Say you're in a car accident and your spinal cord is damaged. It will make it so that, that impulse will travel down the spinal cord but then the motor neuron that should carry it out to the muscle is not able to function properly. Say it was damaged or broken or severed. In those cases, the impulse ends where that spinal cord or nerve was severed, and it's never allowed to travel down and reach the muscle. That's whenever somebody has their legs are paralyzed or they're from the neck down they're paralyzed. It just depends on when those nerves got damaged. The botulism and the myasthenia gravis, those are different because the nerves themselves are completely fine, but the problem is either that at the synaptic knob it's not releasing the acetylcholine, or it is releasing the acetylcholine, but the receptors don't pick up that information and communicate it with the muscle cell. Here's a couple slides that just give us that visual of what's going on with every muscle contraction. Your synaptic knob is full of the acetylcholine, crosses the synaptic cleft, which reacts with the receptors in the motor end plate. The impulse then travels down through structures called the T-tubules, which take that impulse to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it releases the calcium, which moves the troponin, freeing up the binding sites and allowing myosin to form the cross bridges.